Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 305. Today, Gary Wigowski, Vic Tesla, and me, yapping about woodworking. What else do you want in life? I'm just going to get right into it. There's all sorts of things going on, but there's too much going on. It's the holidays. You don't care. Go, go, go get some shop time. Go put the podcast on. Go hang out in your shop and listen to Gary Rogowski and Vic Tesla and talk about sharpening. Because that's really all anyone wants for the holidays. All right. On with it. Gary, how you been? I've been well. I've been well. I had a fascinating experience at the lumber yard yesterday and uh I, can i tell you this quick story oh yeah please do uh, we, so, we are so recording big, we are recording so <laughs> big warehouse no it's fine this is a very upstanding story clean story um a big giant 20 30 000 square foot warehouse it used to be a little tiny place but it's grown and grown and i walk in there there's two trucks backed up to the only door into it and you can't get between them and you can't get to, there's one way you can get in to the warehouse because two guys have decided we are going to get loaded. Well, there's one guy running the forklift and he is pissed off, frantic. Everyone wants him. Um, he can't move fast enough. And, and I'm just walking around going, well, you got my order. And they say, yeah, we can't find it. And, so I go to my salesman and we find it and it's all bundled up and I just need to get it outside. And this guy's got a box truck and he's going to fill it up with plywood and all this stuff. And the guy is complaining, the forklift driver is complaining to him about, you know, I don't have help and everyone's on my case. And, and I go, hmm, I could be here for a really long time. So next time the forklift driver shows up, I say, you sit there. I'm going to unload this for you. So I'm helping the guy in the box truck unload plywood. And, and then this forklift driver starts to talk to me. And I say, oh, I just need that little pile over there. And he serves me. So treat your forklift drivers yes. with great care. That's the moral of the story. 100%. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the forklift dri driver at the lumber yard is like – a dentist or a mechanic or whatever. It's like if you get in the good graces and your life is just so much easier. So much easier. <laughs> that other guy in the truck who was just kind of sitting there waiting to be served. And I was like, I'll help you. <laughs> just let me help. You just sit in that forklift and I will help. And uh, yeah. And then outside he complained to me about how he didn't get any respect. A 50 cent an hour pay raise is not going to do it. So I yeah. hope he gets some, some help. But Mike, yeah. Mike and I were at the lumber yard the other day and, and uh, one of our, the, the forklift driver there, who's our go-to really, he was, yeah. he was in a little bit of a state and he was bumping around and yeah, like, you know, those lumber stacks are, 20 feet high or something like that. And oh, when yeah. they start bumping oh, yeah. into stuff now, I mean, they know the weight that they're dealing with way better than I do and everything. And I, I, but it, it gets scary. Have you ever seen a forklift driver take a corner with a skid? And I mean, a, a plan, plan skid around the corner. Oh, they can, if they know what they're doing, but I think, this guy, Joe, at the time was probably drunk, but um, he sobered. He sobered up. Um, but, yeah, I saw him take a corner with a, you know, like he was outside in the rain. Oh. It was crazy. But yeah. he was a good guy to deal with, and he would save me stuff and say, hey, got a couple pieces leaned up against the wall for you. And so You always have to, really find your, you have to find your key person. Yep. Like, yeah. I've got one at the wood store. I've got one at the tool store. Like I have the people that I deal with and I treat them well and I text them in advance yeah. and say, Hey, can I bring you a coffee? And like, <laughs> yes. oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 This, yeah. He's up in the game here. Oh, oh, yeah. in the game. <laughs> you got to treat people well. I mean, it just, you know, and not just, not just so you can get what you want. I mean, that sounds awfully self-serving, but at the same time, it's like, it, it just, you know, this, you take anybody who works in retail and basically they've taken nothing but guff all day. All right? day. 
all day yeah. and then like you don't know like you could you could turn up and like he's ready to drive the forklift off a cliff and end it all but you're you're being good to him and and helping him out mm -hmm. and all that like that just makes people's day in some cases and so that's good to do just giving them a, l a little bit of respect Instead yeah. of saying, where's my stuff? Right. Well, it just and makes such a difference. Realistically, it's probably the amount of respect that should be allotted to everyone <laughs> that we come Absolutely. in contact with through, throughout the day. But, uh, yeah, the, I, 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 I guarantee you that's a tough job. Um, oh, sure. So, so oh, yeah. question for, for the two of you now that we're, we're talking about this. Um, you know, Mike and I, just we were at the Lumberyard last week and – there's, there's two things that always happen. You know, we, we get to the counter and you start taking a guess at how much it's going to be. And, uh, it's always higher than you expect it to be. But the other thing is Mike just goes, ah, you just never, you're never a hundred percent comfortable. Are you? And it's like, yeah, you're, you're never a hundred percent comfortable with what you just bought. <laughs> Until you get home and start playing in something, it's it's always just a little bit like, and he, I mean, he was buying lumber for classes. So he was like, he just dropped almost a thousand bucks on lumber and he was just sitting there going like, oh, this is rough. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> but, it's but tough. Gary, after all these years, how many books and articles and, and schools and mm -hmm. are you, are you. Are you fully comfortable when you're leaving the, the lumber yard? Yeah, I'm, I'm a lot. Of, it's, it's, it's much easier now. I, it used to be, oh, I've got to get three sticks and they all have to be perfect. And now it's okay. You know, I, I called in the order. I didn't get to pick it. Uh, I just said I needed 100 board feet of alder and I got 125. <laughs> oh, well, uh, you know, it's like going to the, the deli. You always get a little extra. But um, this yard is really good. So if you develop, a, a, like Vic said, if you develop a relationship with your yard, you know they're going to treat you right. They're not going to give you garbage because you treat them right. And it, it's a back and forth thing. And you'll tell people about the service you receive and the quality of the material. So mm -hmm. no, I don't worry about it too much. Uh, I know I'm buying extra. I know there's going to be some garbage in it. and um, But I also know... 80 90 percent of it is going to be really nice and yeah there's some sticker stain in a in a, in a piece and I, how can there be sticker stain <laughs> haven't these guys figured it out by this time but I, there's sticker stain i'll just use it for small stuff it's all right what about you vic if i go in there with a plan i i very often don't feel badly about how it goes um <laughs> My problem is, is that I normally go in with a plan and then they always have this bad habit of like propping up boards at like the ends of the aisles and stuff that look really, really nice. And it's like all of a sudden you can't do anything with it. And then that whole inner Cronovian thing happens where it's like that board wants to be a door. <laughs> 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 and so I think that's what that needs to be. That needs to be a door. That's just, and if you like did like a little bit of an offset and like you know, the grain would look great and then you buy the board and like, you know, you didn't need it. Um, and, nope. and am I actually ever going to build this cabinet with this infamous door? I don't know. Probably. But see, this is what happens. And Andrea asks me about this all the time. She's like, you're telling me you have to go to the wood store. She said, but in your shop up along all one wall is all wood. And it's like, why can't you use that wood? And I'm like, because that wood is not for this. That wood is for something else. Yes. <laughs> for a special project I'm saving it for. Right. I can't use I can't use this piece for this project. No, I'm saving it for a special unnamed project to be named in the future, I hope. I yeah. hope. Right. That, and no. I don't want to be embarrassed at my own estate sale. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gary. I have a problem. I collect wood. Yeah. Uh, it's, Hi, it's your... Gary. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's hard for me to stand up and talk here, but yeah, I was at my, another, a guy who's got a sawmill uh, down Valley and, and, uh, he has great stuff and, and helps you. He says, what are you making? What kind of project are you making? And 
And I took a student down with me and, and uh, he bought this really lovely piece of crotch, Oregon walnut. And so uh, I didn't want to feel left out. I had to buy one too. <laughs> I'm staring at it now in the shop. Why did I, why did I buy this? I got to make a Nakashima style coffee table out of it. Why did I buy this? Anyway, <laughs> I don't regret it. <laughs> so it's the way it is. All right. So let's, Let's get started with questions and let's just go right to the lumber yard one or the lumber question. Oh, huh? Uh, if I can find it. All right. Uh, I actually saw this question and thought of the two of you because I know that you both have hoarding issues and uh, <laughs> sheds or have had sheds. So uh, this is from Cole. Uh, lumber storage question for the group. I have a completely non-climate controlled shed in the backyard, yet for some reason, I keep my lumber in my single car garage shop. Thus, I have far too much lumber to use on my next few projects that is just in the way in my shop. Is there any reason I can't leave the, my lumber in my shed? Is there any concern about degradation of the lumber by being kept in the shed instead of my garage. My garage isn't climate controlled, but being inside the house, it has fewer swings in temperature. So, Gary, you have a shed. Um, well, I have a I have a shipping container okay. uh, that I'm putting a shelter over, and and that'll give me more room to buy wood and and store it. Um, you know it it. it there's always an issue, and I think we may have talked about this once before. Do you store your wood uh, horizontally so that the only piece you need is the one on the bottom of the pile? Or, or do you store it vertically so that the piece you need is at the back and you can't really see it? So it, either way, it's, it's troublesome. But I heck yeah, use a shed. I mean, it depends on your environment, but... Um, that being said, I would have a couple of feet on either end and certainly that much on the side. So it's out of the sun and out of the, out of the weather. I got no problem storing my stuff outside. Yeah. So it just needs to not get rained on. Right, Vic? Yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, like, um, at my last place, um, you know, we had a shed and I stored everything vertically. Um, and, uh, the only thing that you have to keep in mind is that you've got to give it a little bit of breathing time, you know, between, you know, taking it out of the shed and then into now, like I was going from a unclimate controlled shed to a climate controlled shop. And so when you do that, you got to allow for a bit of a swing to happen there. A um, couple weeks typically, and then I'm, I'm fine to work with it. Um, if you're working, and, and I mean, it's less of a problem, of course, if you're not climate controlled, um, then, you know, it, it's going to tend to be about the same. Um, but yeah, I mean, having having a shed, I mean, m most drying sheds, you know, if you build a drying shed for the purpose of storing and drying wood, um, you know, they're designed with spaces in between all of the vertical slats to allow the wind to go through. You basically just don't want the weather and the, and like Gary said, the weather and the, and the sun pounding on it. But I mean, if you had like, I, in some cases, I had like a big piece of corrugated tin that I would just throw on top of it and weight it down with a couple of, you know, uh, five gallon pails of, of sand or, you know, whatever. And just as long as it doesn't, water isn't allowed to stand on the wood. Um, and it, I mean, stickering is nice too. You want to be able to, you know, so that it's not, you know, if, if moisture does get in there, it's not trapped between two boards or whatever. Um, but I mean, I just had one inch by one inch pine stickers and, um, away they went. So yeah, you can for sure do that. I had the um, joy of, of getting a holly tree. And holly grows a lot here in the Northwest. But getting a, a wide enough tree that's not just full of little pin knots is, is kind of rare. So I, I got it and I sliced it up. And then I stickered it and uh, uh, put band clamps on it so it couldn't move. Stuck it on some uh, two-by-fours out behind my garage. Put a piece of tin, like Vic, Vic said over the top that covered it up and, you know, about a foot on, on every side and said, see you next year. 
So, so it's fine. It's just fine. Where I am now, the sun is a much bigger issue than than the weather. But you know, if it snows where you are, you just got to make sure you, either the snow can't get to it or you brush it off. And the, the problem with stickers when you're storing wood is it you've just lost half your space. So, I, you know, I'm I'm more concerned with getting the wood um, on some. Um, timbers up off the ground or on cinder blocks up off the ground and then just ch- kind of give a quick look to see if the if the pile is twisted or you know got a bow in it or something and just try and level it out as best you can and after that I just pile it up and I don't sticker it you don't sticker there. it not because not when cause, it's cause, in store there's more wood coming yeah they don't have space for stickers yeah, okay uh, now, now I, you know, my I, I'm doing the setting up shop class, and this week's project is making stickers. So as soon as the piece comes into the shop, then it's on stickers for the rest of its life until it's in the piece. Everything's on stickers, but out for storage, no, everything hmm. just gets stored. Now if it's air dried, that's different. So if you just cut it and it's air dried, that's a completely different story. But if it's KD, nah, I don't, I don't worry about it. I just dry. try and keep it dry. Yeah, kiln dry. Yeah, KD. Sorry, not everyone's um, as familiar with with KD. So, yeah. in Canada, KD is mac and cheese. What? Because huh? it's craft cr- dinner. <laughs> Get that. No, I for learn real. Something new every day. Yeah, yeah. If you have KD in Canada, you're having craft dinner, which is yeah. mac and cheese. Wow. There you go. All there right. Go. So, so yeah. Vic, how's how's that elm that you milled up coming? Is it dry oh, really good. Yeah, I've used it for a few projects now. Um, so I um, I don't know, Gary, if you'd heard this story, but we had this huge Siberian elm uh, cut oh, yeah. down. And Siberian yeah. elm is, you know, kind of regarded as junk wood because it's, you know, it's like a, it's like a weed, basically. Uh, mm-hmm. It grows super fast and it's like got really big, um, really big rings in it and stuff. But I just thought, ah, oh, what the heck? I mean, even if I use it just for shop projects or whatever. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I um, I sawed it at 12 quarter because the guy recommended that he said it's going to lose a lot of thickness. Um, right. And so, oh no, sorry, I sawed it at 10 quarter and oh. he said because it's going to dry down to 8 quarter. And I thought, wait a minute, it's going to lose that much? What? Yeah. But there's so much free water in Siberian Elm that it uh, just it sh- it literally shrinks and and is about a third of the weight as it was wet. It's unbelievable. Wow. wow. But yeah, it's been dried. It's now uh, stacked in my shop, or not stacked, but it's vertical against the wall. And every time I have to do something shop related, I just grab a I grab a board of it and plane it up. And it, I mean, the color is a you know it's elm, so it's like, meh, it's Brown. okay. But it's hard. Yeah. It's it's stringy and it's it's hard yeah. and it's all those yeah. things. But yeah, no, it works fine. It's free, yeah, but, yeah, free, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah. I traded the Sawyer like a YouTube video of the process. So I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, really I did it. Yeah. I did it as like, yeah. hey, do you want a video of like the whole process? And so I came and I helped him out, and he sh- we sawed up all the material, and he came and got the logs, brought them to oh, his nice. place. Oh, and nice. Then we did the thing and then he loaded it back up onto the trailer and then we brought it back to my place and stickered it all up and it dried for two and a half years before I, or two years before I cut into it. Right. So. A couple of things that, that you do have to pay attention to with leaving your wood outside. Um, if you store vertically, uh, it's got to be off the ground. Mm-hmm. Can't have any, Can't have anything sitting on the ground. Even if it's gravel, you should have it off the ground somehow. Um, and there is the issue of bugs. And so, you know, depending on the species, um, you could have bugs and <laughs> there you go. Um, the, the one sawmill I, I dealt with, he would, all his stuff was air dried and then he would, uh, he had a kiln, but, uh, didn't always use it. And, but he, if I bought something, he would throw it in his kiln for two days at 120 degrees and bug kill it. Oh, so, huh, cool. So that that was kind of nice. So you say, okay, there's no bugs in. But I bought a big chunk, this weird off cut of walnut that was really pretty. And it was 
God, I couldn't even do it. It's sort of a wedge shape. It was really like four inches thick at one end and an inch and a half thick at the other. I made a bench out of it. Anyway, uh, I, I called Mark up and I said, so how do I, you didn't bug kill this. How do I make sure there's no there's no bugs in it? He said, well, you can stick it in a microwave. I said, no, it's four uh, feet long. I'm not going to stick it in a microwave. He said, oh, yeah, you're probably right. But, you know, here's what here's a word of advice. Never microwave a frozen rat. All right, that's enough. Now I'll go on. And like, what? He's a scientist. He said that what you can do is wrap it up and stick it in a uh, a freezer for two days. So I wrapped it up in in plastic. I took it to the uh, to the local uh, store, the grocery store. I, I knew all those guys really well, and I and I talked to them and I said, "I'm doing this project, and this is for my finish. <laughs> so would you stick it in your in your deep freeze?" Over the weekend, you know, so, you know, not a lot of traffic. And I talked to him into it. And so I got it bug killed that way. I didn't tell him, <laughs> sort of telling them the truth. It was for finish. But anyway. Eventually. Um, eventually. Um, uh, Rogelio, who, my student, had, had bought this big chunk of, uh, of walnut from the sawmill. And, um, you know, right at the edge, you know, it's, it's three feet across. A th- single stick of walnut. Um, you could see where the sapwood was, and you could see the bug holes there. So, as long as they're now, this had been bug killed. But if if bug holes keep showing up and you keep seeing piles of sawdust, then you've got to deal with it, which is boric acid, I believe, um, to kill the bugs. So, hmm. yeah. Oh, another thing: uh, get one of those pinless moisture meters. So you you know when you bring your stock in, you can check it uh, in terms of moisture content. And then when you bring it inside, give it a week and go, oh, has it changed? It hasn't changed. Oh, or it has. It has changed a lot, right? Um, but that's, I never thought I needed one. And then when I got it, it was, it really makes sense. I don't use it a lot, but it's, is, it's is, nice to have just a rough idea. Is it worth the upgrade for pinless price-wise? Oh, mine was a hundred bucks. Really? And yeah, yeah. It's yeah, one of the Wagner lignometers. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, the pin ones, like the, I mean, the the fault in them is that they are um, big that they holes. Only, they, well, that <laughs> and they only go into like you know, if you can get a quarter of an inch in, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty awesome without, you know, breaking it. Um, and then you're really, it's not reading all the way through. Right. So the pinless ones are better. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know how much better. I, I worked in the forest one summer and they would come and check to see if we could saw on those days. And they had a, a slide hammer on their uh, moisture meter and they would just wham, wham, wham. <laughs> bang it Bexford, into the, Bexford's got one of those, yeah. Yeah, bang it into the board. So, um, yeah, it's just a rough idea. But, you know, if, if you're using the same meter, then you get a rough idea that, oh, it's 20, mm-hmm. it's off the charts, which is probably over 12%. <laughs> it's right. off the charts wet. Oh, it, now it says eight, which means 10, depending on which species it is, or it means six, depending on species, because all those uh, moisture meters are calibrated to a, a sp- mine is calibrated to cherry and fir. So it reads that exactly. And then everything else, you get out the old manual and see what it really means. Plus it helps you sort your firewood when you get it from the firewood dude. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, Next question. All right. So this one, I'm going to do my best to describe it for the audio only uh, audience. Um, This one's from Mark. I recently got a lot of tools from my uncle who had a pretty nice shop for about 60 years. That included a, that included boxes of router bits. Among them was an unidentifiable one. Uh, And uh, Mark sent me a link. Um, And so for the most part, it looks to me like a V-bit that you would use for engraving or something like that. 
but then the shank l- might be sharpened as well. Is anyone else seeing that? Um, yeah. So the V part, the V part doesn't actually have cutters on it. No. But but the shaft, the shaft. So imagine imagine a straight bit yeah. with a V cutter or with a V shape at the top instead of it being flat. But that V is not actually a cutter. You're saying the V is not a cutter because I see there's definitely. Do you see cutters on there? I I I see opposing faces like you would have on a blade. Huh. Um, and yes. I have seen engraving bits like that. So <clears throat> if it were solid carbide, yes, but this is not a solid carbide. You're bit. right. You're right. Good point. No, it's brazed. Okay. Mm. It's definitely brazed. And there's a cutter below that V and a, a, a barrel below the V. So there's a barrel that's probably half an inch long and the top of it's cut into that V. And below that is a carbide cutter. I know what it is. You know what it is? Oh, yeah. I looked at it and I went, oh, look at that. I don't know what. And then I thought about it, I thought about it. I go, I know what that is. This is a laminate trimmer. And here's how it works. That's what Uh, I thought it was too, but I wasn't sure. So that barrel, instead of a bearing runs against the edge of your plywood. So this is from, this is a Rockwell bit. Rockwell got bought by Delta. So Delta Rockwell, um, for, I don't know, 70s. So this is probably a bit from the 60s or 70s. And so I have still in my collection of router bits, these things called bottoming bits. And so what you do back then when you were making plywood boxes is you take your dado set, which was really crappy, not carbide tipped, no anti-kickback uh, teeth on it, and you'd make this crappy cut. It would be the right width, but it, the bottom of it would be kind of crappy. So you take this bearing with a, uh, or I'm sorry, you take this bit, about a three quarters of an inch long with a barrel on it on the top and a cutter on the bottom, and you'd run that barrel inside your groove and clean out the bottom, bottoming bit. So this is the same concept of a barrel that runs against the plywood and then you clean up your, your P lamb on top. Your, That's how it works. Your, your, your P lamb. Yeah. <laughs> Plastic. Yeah. It's like KD. Yeah. You got your P lamb. You got your KD. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but keep up. <laughs> now here you go. Plastic so back laminate then, for mica plastic. kind of thing going. Okay, so 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 the point of, of of the bit is for piercing through like a sink cutout or something. That's probably it. And then um, then it's basically a crude flush trim. But yeah, well, I, you know, I don't know how crude. I, it might leave a mark because it's not a bearing that stops when you come into contact with something. It's just always spinning at your router speed. But it would come in. So your PLM, you you lay your plastic laminate down over the edge just by an eighth of an inch or so. But it, you know, back then you were using this nasty contact cement. Um, I helped a guy do cabinets for a day, and I said, "No more of this for me." Contact cement was just nasty stuff. Anyway, it you'd lay it down and roll it out with a laminate roller and a J roller. And and then come back and get the edges, get the edges cleaned up, and then come back with the file and, and make them friendly. Boy, that was fun work. <laughs> <laughs> I had a whole career of it in a day and said, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Did you figure so, that one out, Vic? Well, um, I've seen that bit before. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a modern version of it right now, but I can't, I'm not able to, um, I'm not able to, it's in, I remember seeing it in this 75 bit router kit. <laughs> Cause you know, you need yep. 75 router bits for, for 59.99. And so, right. um, and, I, and I remembered it having that bit in it. And wow. so I was just on their website, but they don't sell the bit by itself. And so 
and they have this really cruddy photo that you can't zoom into. But I'm going to do a little <laughs> bit of research, All right. uh, and I'll get back to you on it. But basically, uh, what Gary uh, Gary was 100 percent spot on. So basically, the idea is is that you would put like. Uh, P lamb, if we're using the technical term. Uh, after after having some KD and you're about to work some P lamb, um, basically what you would do is like you would plunge that through the P lamb and then run it along the inside of like to cut out. You know what I mean? Like you look at the way like a lot of construction work now is done where they'll sheathe the entire house mm -hmm. and then they'll use a trimming bit and then just cut out the window holes uh, out of the OSB with the with the, with a trimmer. It's basically the same idea, except um, no bearing. And yeah. so everything Gary says is true. It it'll burn, guaranteed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's going to burn. Oh, sure. But when it's a sink opening, okay. you know who cares? Because you're just yeah, going to drop a sink into it. No one's ever going to see it. So right. Or you just cover it up with more PLAM edging. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You do a glue strip or something. Uh, yeah, Ben so. just wanted to say P lamb again. I, I'm gonna get one, I'm gonna get that in as many times as I can. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it's, but Vic, you you bring up a really good point though, and almost why I put the question in there is that if somebody came to me with a box of router bits, I wouldn't take it. Send them away. I. <laughs> I think I use four router bits. I have maybe 15 and I use four. Like, so like, I now I do specific work, but like, I'm pretty sure I need mm. two or three variations of a straight bit, uh, a pattern bit, a flush trim bit, and then I'd like to have a round over or two, maybe of various sizes, and then a chamfer bit. What else do you really need when you get to get, when you get going? So listen, the problem the problem with router bits is the same with all tools, and I'm sure Gary's seen this a million times because I've seen it a thousand times. So just by just Are you by sheer Gary time. Old? No, yeah. I'm saying Gary's been <laughs> teaching longer than I have. <laughs> I would never say something so bold and rash, especially not when it's being recorded, because it wouldn't be fair to Gary to not be able to respond in the manner in which he'd like to. But anyway. Um, I can't keep up with you youngsters anyways. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, don't, right. I don't believe that's, that for that's a minute. De that's definitely the, the way it goes around here. It's you old guys that are the ones that we got to watch out for. Um, but seriously, what happens is, is when you start woodworking, you buy everything. Right. Every single measuring tool, every single marking tool, every saw configuration, every plane configuration, every, every, everything. And it's the same thing with router bits. And then you start to work and you start to realize that the gummy stuff that protects the blades on those router bits is still on there 10 years later. It's <laughs> never been used. Right. Because like I, I don't use a Roman OG uh, <laughs> ever. Uh, I know. I know. Shocked. I am but, shocked. Yeah. But what I did start doing and I was guilty of this myself. I had a lot of router bits of various types and persuasions. And then what I realized was is that I only use, like Ben said, a handful of them. And so what I started doing was is instead of buying like I would buy sort of middle of the line sort of router bits. Now what I've done is, is like, once I made that realization, when I went to purchase, like, let uh, half inch straight bit, right, gets used a fair, fair bit, um, I bought a really good one from like a really, like, like a, like a, a North American made, good quality, lots of carbide, and said, okay, I'm only going to, if I actually need the bit, I'm only going to buy a really high quality one. Um, and they last longer, they're sharpenable, even though they do change, uh, a little bit, but that's, you know, they're nominal anyway. Um, but that's what I started doing. So like, yeah, the, the, the hand, the, the, the big kits of router bits and having 20, you know, 20 boxes of router bits, that, that's, that's a factor of just getting started and you don't know what you need until, until you start working. And then you're like, oh, 
this is what I need. It's the same thing like with carving tools. You can mm. buy a, a, a set and you get a set of 10 and you get three or four that you'll never use. You'll just never use them. So, right. Uh, yeah, it's a little cheaper, but in the end, it's not cheaper because you're paying for tools that you're not using. Right. I wrote an article some years ago about um, the 10 router bits you need, but you know, it just depends on what you're doing. Uh, straight bits, but what type of straight bits? Um, I think you need a rabbiting bit and a coving yep. bit. I would add those two. You're right. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. But those, but that's, you know, straight bits and, and uh, flush trimming bits. Chamfer. Yeah, chamfer bits. Um, although I got a, a 30 degree chamfer bit that I used, or 60 degree chamfer bit that I would use more than my 45, just to be different, you know. You just got to be just a little, a little, little contrarian. There's the line. I'm going somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. 100%. I respect yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. 100%. All right. Yeah. I, I, I think of a box of random bits as like, if somebody, like if a family member gave it to me, I'd be like, thank you so much. And then I'd toss it or find someone who give it, make it I, somebody else's problem. I have my grandfather's roll of Stanley uh, number 45 multi-plane bits uh -huh. or cutters. And 90% of them are completely useless. But I have some, and it's always by my bench. Mm -hmm. It's always there. And uh, I use these little guys as straight cutters, as, as tiny scrapers. Yeah, it's, ni it's nice to have that by my bench. That's cool. Cool. Yeah. Take a break. Sutherland Wells believes that your exceptional craftsmanship deserves an exceptional finish. They handcraft their full line of low and VOC exempt finishes and stains with the highest quality, cold pressed, sustainably grown tongue oil. Their polymerization process gives you the grain enhancing, wood nurturing, deep penetration and non-yellowing protection of raw tongue oil, but decreases drying time and allows the oil to both penetrate and build a film finish. Sutherland Wells Traditional Oil Aesthetic for the Contemporary Woodworker. Use code FWW23 for 10% off your first order. So I just want to profess my undying love of cork. Cork. Cork, <laughs> okay. double stick tape, and a perfectly sized call is heaven. Huh. Yeah. It's is heaven. Nice. I, I, okay. I, so there, you know, there are things that I stress out about in, in processes in making ukuleles and, um, sometimes it's clamping things up and I decided to take the time to perfectly, I CNC'd out calls that are perfectly spaced off of between, you know, from the, you know, the thickness of the side and the part that's getting glued in and everything. And I decided, Oh, let me just add in uh, another millimeter and put cork on it. And let, let, let's really make this a leisure call. And there are few things more satisfying than a call that perfectly works. That is lined <laughs> with cork that you're not worried about, you know, denting the piece uh and then i even went one step further and i i i put uh packing tape over the over the cork so the cork stopped getting glued to the to the piece too it just you know perfect calls are heaven and cork is a part of that hmm. that's good you're right a good call, like a a nice purpose-made call yeah is is a thing of beauty yeah yeah I have an old funky grinding wheel that I don't let anyone touch. It's set up at a perfect angle. Uh, I've got a, I'll call it custom made. It's just a piece of wood for my table on it. And I've had it forever, but you know, I'm, I'm sitting there working and wondering why, why is life so hard? Well, it's because your chisel is dull, you knucklehead. Go, <laughs> go and sharpen it. And it'll just take five five minutes at most. 
uh, to get it sharp and, you know, go back over to the granny wheel and reestablish my hollow and then go to the sharpening stones and get things done. And I'm back at it. That's a nice thing. I rely on that. I, I It's tough not having that. What, what's what's so special about this grinding stone? Is it just the grinding wheel? Yeah, yeah, uh, nothing. It's just a uh, well. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 sentimental about my tools. Uh, the guy who I met in college, who was a physicist, um, had bought it, and he was going to be a metal worker, and he had a lathe in his garage. And I thought, well, I didn't want to do that. I don't want to turn metal. Um, but you know, my grandpa was a carpenter and maybe I could try my hand at woodworking. And so when Joel left, uh, to go to New Zealand, um, to be an astronomer, uh, he sold me this grinding wheel for 40 bucks and, uh, I still got it and, and it's got the original motor it's got a belt on it that has seen a hundred thousand miles easy. And it should fall apart. If I had a big glove on it, I could probably kill the motor. It's completely underpowered, but it grinds perfectly. And it's that's such a huge part of my sharpening routine. And it was from my my good buddy. So that's it. That sounds nice. Tools. Yeah, tools uh, have this. They can have meaning. Not all yeah. of them do. But they can really have meaning. So, and totally. and pieces of wood we not so much but tools i think really can have some kind of history to them or something you can feel it in the tool when you get an old tool sometimes you just go oh this is somebody loved this tool <laughs> well that's all vic do you have any uh sentimental tools they're speaking um, to you right now i don't have any sentimental tools um i I do, I, I did get a new tool, um, though it's not really a tool. Um, so this week I was uh, cutting mortises for some workbenches that I'm building and I wanted the mortise centered in the leg. And so, <clears throat> so, I, so I did the layout work and then I got out my router and I set it all up to make my mortises dead center because then, because I like cutting my tenons on the uh, on the bandsaw, and so it's always nice when you can just set it up, push it through one way, flip it over, push it through again, and then boom, it's centered. Life is good, uh, and away you go. So I uh, I realized that I had not centered the mortise. I thought I had centered the mortise. <laughs> and so I then realized that um, I was, sometimes if I don't have my glasses on, I sort of try to use the force uh, okay. to see things. <laughs> How's that working for me? <laughs> well, <laughs> in this case, not at all. Um, <laughs> and so I actually ended up buying one of those, uh, like, flip down you can change the magnifiers yep. in them it's got like a little light and like yep so because what i ended up doing was is i so i'm you, you know when you sit there and you realize that you've made the mistake and you're trying to say okay well how do i fix this because that's not like there's no sense getting upset about it it's like you know mistakes happen all the time you just figure out how to work around it and away you go but then i realized oh god now i have this offset and now i gotta make sure that you know, like I, I got to make the first cut and then I got to make the second cut at a different spot. And I'm like, this is not worth it. So I ended up making the mortise bigger using, uh, using a technique to mark out the extra wood, used a paring block, chopped a couple of millimeters away on that wall. And then, you know, life was good. I was originally going to leave the mortises round. Because uh, for me, it's much easier to round a tenon than it is to square a mortise. Um, but anyway, so I ended up squaring them anyway uh, and doing all that other stuff. But I guess the hard won wisdom there was it's like, listen, just accept the fact that like you're getting old and things are going to hell in a handbasket. 
and just get the get the tools that you need in order to you know to do what you need to do properly and without error and all that other stuff. I was like a millimeter and a half off, which is quite substantial. That's, yeah. Uh, to my mind. Um, so I don't know what that is in, uh, in the That's, King's foot gentlemen. I, I apologize. Um, but, um, it's about 16th. what is that? A, fi- uh, no. 16th is 1.6 millimeters. Yeah. So a six. Yeah. So that's yeah. It's substantial. And so, um, so it's like, okay, that's enough of that. Uh, we're going to get something that is going to do the trick. And, uh, so now when I do my markouts and stuff, I put this thing on and it's like, it looks ridiculous. Like I, I feel like, uh, like <laughs> no, no, own it. It looks cool. It looks cool because I, I, I look should, good in them. You should wear it to the grocery store. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, these are definitely a contraception device. These are um, <laughs> there. <laughs> but like I'm telling you, when you you turn on the little light and they've got the light brightness well dialed in on these things, um, because I've tried using, you know, like the headlamps that you take camping, right. they're too bright. Right. And yeah. so they end up like just basically blowing out all the detail. And then like if you've got some sort of a metal measuring device, it just shines the light right back at you and it, you know, you're blind. But these little, these little things, and they're not anything I didn't spend a million dollars on them. I ordered them from Amazon. I, they, you know, they, they, I think they were $30 or something, but like, I'm so telling there you. There are ones that are, cause I, I've, I've started wearing them um, when I'm doing finicky bits and uh i think i was expecting too much out of them Mm. and i kept putting in like the two and a half x lenses oh and really having a hard time focusing because you have to be like eight inches from the thing yeah and you know operating a chisel with your eyes eight inches away from the from the piece is is not real it's not a good idea. No. And, um, and so I kind of gave up on them and Tim Coleman and I were doing a video and he wears them all. He wears them at the table saw. I mean, he, Tim Coleman likes to see the line, likes to really, he, Tim Coleman doesn't mess around as we know. But so I started asking him, I was like, what, what strength lens are you wearing he goes no it's just the one or the 1.5 and i never even tried the one because it doesn't make it i still somebody explained it to me one time makes no sense to me whatsoever i i'm multiplying this by one it should be nothing it should be exactly what my eyes see right Mm, no it's different than that it's It's different Yeah, yeah yeah so i just think one x does not multiply into anything other than the original number. So th- that's where my head's at. So I've started using the one and the 1.5 and absolutely Vic. Yeah. You look dumb, but it's totally worth it. You know, what looks really dumb is an inch and a half millimeter offset. That looks dumb. <laughs> yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to avoid. Yeah. Mm. All right. So let's let's do one last question, the sharpening question. Uh, da, 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 da. This one from. No, can Tim. we just answer this guy's type on three question really quick? Okay. We you, we always do this. We 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 always do this. All right. Let's get this one. This type on three. Uh, we have Javon who uh, is making a cutting board or not a cutting board, a chessboard. And while gluing up the alternating strips, I accidentally grabbed one of the spare maple strips, which hadn't been trimmed to final width. This resulted in misalignment of the dark and white squares. I didn't notice until I had cut and glued all of the squares. Uh, I'm hesitant to cut the squares using a table saw as I will lose an eighth of an inch of variance. Uh, My plan, assuming this is possible, is to break the type on three glue bond using a heat gun set to 185 degrees and some clamping pressure to break the glue bond and then trim all of the squares with a shooting board. All right. Gary has opinions. <laughs> well, 
I think he's just going to burn his piece off. Um, I, I've never tried to to take a type on. I've never tried to take a type on joint apart. I just, I think um, it's vinegar that you soak it in. I could be wrong about that. But I think it has to be I, type one though to work. I don't think type three the vinegar works. Oh. Yeah. There's, there's, I think he's going to run into problems trying to heat his piece up. It's just going to break. Just cut strips, cut with a thin curved blade, strips or uh, grooves between the black and white strips to set them apart, all of them. And that should be able to pick up the difference. If it's only a 16th. He didn't say how much it was. It was off. But um, instead of the all the walnut and maple pieces being exactly next to each other, there's a little tiny groove between them, and that should be able to eliminate the misalignment without burning this piece up. I think the, you can totally use heat to, to unglue. Luthiers do it all the time. With high um, glue? Yeah, you're using high glue. <clears throat> No, they do it with, they, no, they do it with, okay. with type on one. They do it with type on, th they'll, th you get enough heat on there. That glue's coming apart. Um, they don't, when a luthier takes a neck off of a guitar, they don't know what glue was on there. They just know that the neck has to come off. Mm, right. They get the neck off. <clears throat> um, the problem is going to be you're, you're, you're going to heat all of the joints up. Mm -hmm. Right, like you're not going to be able to isolate that bad joint. You're gonna the whole thing is gonna get heated up to 185 degrees, and then it's either all gonna fall apart, or even worse, it's not gonna fall apart and be weak, and then yeah. eventually fall apart because the, right. the the glue bond has been messed with. So, I think I would take a straight edge and a and a dovetail saw and saw it apart with as thin of a curve as possible. And the other thing you oh, could do Vic's is shaking his head. No, <laughs> what's Vic going to do? Listen, yeah, woodworking, woodworking is referred to as the workmanship of risk because every step you get forward, you have more and more to lose. And so that's why it's critical that you try to pay attention the whole time as you're going through stuff. And so that's one of those situations where you, where it's like a hard lesson because <laughs> everything that you do to try to fix this is going to be a level of faff not known to man. Like, like trying to saw it with a thin curve, trying to do this, trying to do that. The reality is, is that anything you do is going to be painfully obvious that you've done it. And so my, it's, there's certain things you can fix that will working, but when it comes to geometric patterns like that, uh, if you mess it up, then you just go cut some more strips and you laminate them up again and you, Hard and the whole you, time you <laughs> self flatulate. Okay. Get your whip. And do your and and remember, listen, this is what happens when you don't pay attention. Wow. And so unfortunately, that's that's my opinion on it. It's it's a hard lesson. It's a hard lesson to learn, but it's one that is critical. I think if he can make those cuts, I saw a chessboard once that had basically uh crumb catching grooves. So that's that's why I suggested that one. But I I think that 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 might work. But you know, a really thin curved blade. I was working with Phil Lowe one time and uh and Phil said, Oh yeah, you put on this it's like a sixteenth inch wide blade, seven and a quarter inch blade for a circ circular saw. I was gonna say circ saw, but then I'd have to explain. KD I was a circ saw I didn't, crew. Didn't have KD before I picked up my circ saw. Um, Live and, at the PLAM. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's not. That's, that's a great. It sounds party. like a good time. It really. That's does. a great. Yeah, party. the PLAM is a great place. 
you haven't been there yet? Oh man, it smells bad, and you, yeah. can, you can get <laughs> cut on it. <laughs> What's not to love? <laughs> um, anyway, that's a really thin curve blade, and um, I don't know. Even why I bought that, I don't know. Think it's a lot of feeling. faff. It's a lot of faff. You you just yeah. you're constantly gonna for the amount of time it would take you to come up with some cunning plan, you could just say, you know what? Okay, I messed up. Let's cut some more strips and let's let's do this right the next right. time. Yeah, if you could cut off that offending member or wherever however much it shows up. Yeah, I would save what's what's good and get back to it. But yeah, I would avoid yeah, trying to reverse the glue joint, boy. Yeah, no, that won't work out well at all. Nothing but trouble. Nothing but trouble. Nothing but a hearty. <clears throat> now, for Tim, I'm going to try and shorten Tim's question a little bit. Tim has basically, he is a Diamond Stone user and um, has uh, the has not been getting a mirror finish due to the scratch pattern left by diamond stones. Um, the, the extra, extra fine is only marginally sharper than the extra fine. Um, so he sold his extra, extra fine and is wondering if he can switch to water stones halfway through. He's thinking about getting a 8,000 grit Shapton, um, or an oil stone. So wanting to get that finished, edge on something other than a diamond stone. <clears throat> Gary. So you would... oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I think, I think, um, the Shapton is, is a, is a fine choice. Um, I use water stones, uh, myself. I wouldn't gave up oil stones for Lent one year and I've never gone back and I'm happy. So I, yeah, I, and I use a 6,000 grit which is fine. You want a really sharp edge though. So I go from my, I use an extra coarse diamond stone to shape the edge and then go to my water stones. But when I'm done on the 6,000 grit stone, then I, then I strop it with a uh, compound called Herb's Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. And ooh la la, ooh la la, that, uh, Rod Stewart song. Da, 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 da. No, it's Faces actually. No. Was oh, is it Faces? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah. That got that's, weird that's real quick. Magic. <laughs> Go ahead, give me a beat. Give me. Go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, what are you using for a substrate for stropping? Leather. Oh, or? it's on a piece. Yeah, it's the suede side of the leather on a piece of plywood. And screwed screwed down to the piece of plywood, and I just butter it up with the herbs yellowstone. But, the only place but you have you have no problem with uh, with uh, switching between with somebody switching between diamond and no. I mean water. you're cleaning off. Yeah. No, you're cleaning off between. It doesn't matter. This is just rubbing. It's just abrasives. Uh, if you're cleaning it off in between, and you're not contaminating one medium with another. No, I have no no problem at all. I mean, oil and water, mixing that, I, I wouldn't go to an oil stone. So the Shapton's water uh, for cleanup, and uh, that'd be fine. And Vic, you're about simplest possible way that you can get sharp done, right? Yeah, like, I mean, I think that, um, so first of all, the oil stone is not not the place to go because oil stones aren't, don't get fine enough. Um, there's a reason why we strop like we used to strop tools after they came off the oil stones. And that's because oil stone really can only get around sort of the 4,000 grit point. Um, and in fact, oil stones are funny because you notice that they never say what grit they are because they're, it's not the grit size that's important with an oil stone. It's the grit dispersion that is more important. So um, finer stones have grit tighter packed together, whereas uh, coarser oil stones they're further apart and so that's how you get the differing um so that's why you get like the, the typically the finest you can get is what was called surgical black or black arkansas uh and that is around the four thousand point and then you would strop now um so i used to trap when i used to travel i used to travel with two oil stones and a strop because they wouldn't break 
in the belly of the plane when it got to minus whatever it gets underneath there and shatters your stones. Um, so I started traveling with oil stones and it was never a problem. Um, so, so the oil stones out, you're not going to find an oil stone that's fine enough to do what you're, you're, you're I mean, you're already there with your diamonds. Um, so then like Gary said, there's no problem switching between different medias. Um, you can go from diamonds to a water stone. Uh, you can go to uh, something of a scary shark method where you're using an adhesive uh, back sandpaper. Um, you can even buy them. Um, 3M makes them graded in microns. So you can get like 15 micron, 5 micron and 0.5 micron. 0.5 micron is pretty is pretty fine um, and it gives you a really good edge. Some people use the green honing compound, Gary uses the yellow. Um, there's all kinds of different ways that you can do it. Um, but the reality is, is that um, you, can, you can switch to whichever one you want. Um, it really doesn't matter. Um, so Gary stops at 6,000 and then strops. Um, I used to go from 4,000 to 8,000 um, and then and sometimes putting something in between is handy, right? Like going from the six, having that intermediate spot on the six and then going up to the strop or like, so I would say that a strop and a number eight or a t uh, like an 8,000 or a 10,000 grit stone, that's about the same sort of level, okay. right? And then you get above that and that's just a way of separating you from your money because uh, any, any benefits you get from that, like a 35,000 grit stone uh, is basically uh, going to be gone in the first couple of wax or first couple of passes. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so you can, you know, the Shapton, Shapton makes good stones. Um, you could do, you could go up to, and it depends too, because like what, what a shop, what Shapton calls 6,000 isn't necessarily correct. Isn't like, isn't, you know, like I've used six thousands that are finer than eight thousands, um, and so what you want is a stone that is more of a polishing stone versus a cutting stone, in my opinion, uh, because what you're doing at that point is polishing the edge. You're not you're not necessarily wanting to cut, and so some stones are cutters and others are polishers, and the difference is is that they have a different uh, binder in them, and so. Uh, a stone that's a cutter is extremely friable, which means that it wears away very quickly so that it's constantly exposing new grit, which makes it cut fast, but then it also dishes fast. Um, if you look at like an Imanashi stone, uh, which is known as a good polishing stone, um, their 8,000 is equivalent to a lot of 10,000 grit stones. Oh. So, and that's because it's got a harder binder and so it's more of a polishing, polishing stone than a cutting stone. Now, that's just a layman woodworker's thoughts on sharpening. If you're on a sharpening um, forum, uh, please don't feel the need to comment uh, because nobody cares. But um, <laughs> because we're all just because we just want to woodwork. We don't care about right. sharpening right. a blade to take off the, you know, butt hair of a gnat. Um, yeah. You know, so for me, it's like, I mean, I've switched completely over the last couple of years. I use a Tormek, but I'm using diamond stones on the Tormek. And then I'm finishing off with a leather, uh, with a compound on a leather wheel with a three micron paste. And that, that gives me beautiful mirror finishes. And more importantly, <laughs> more importantly, really sharp edges. So and back to work. And back, yeah, and yeah. back to work. And like Gary <laughs> said, there's nothing better, like when he talked about his grinding stone, like getting that tuned up and then just getting back to work. That's the goal with sharpening. So if you, if you, I like the diamonds for the rough work. Gary likes the diamonds for the rough work. And then go over to your water stones um, and away you go. That's, you're living the dream. Yeah, I, I was working with a student and, Okay, he was he has, as you described earlier, Vic, every tool imaginable. And um so I said, Okay, we need to sharpen. Because clearly these tools of yours aren't working. We need to sharpen. 
So what, where's your sharpening setup? Well, he's got to pull out the Tormek. Uh, he's got to find the thing. He's got to find this. this. Now you got to simplify things. Um, and so if you're using the Tormek, use it, have it set up all the time, be ready to go. Um, my goal is, as I tell my students, I hate sharpening. Yeah, I love same. the results. Yeah. I love mm -hmm. the results. Same. No, it makes such a huge difference in, in your work, in your day, in your ability to, to make cuts. So when I first started, I didn't know how to sharpen. Why would I use hand tool? I don't know how to sharpen. I couldn't, I couldn't make them work. Um, but once I did learn how to sharpen and, and the methods got tuned up and, the, you know, you tweak them and adjust them. I didn't use uh, diamond stones. Um, one day, uh, one of uh, my favorite editor was in, was in town. Vinny was in town, and uh, we were shooting an article. And this guy walks in, the sales type. And I was like, whenever salesmen would walk in, now, this was a big building. There was like twelve or fifteen shops in this big warehouse. This guy walks in. I'm like, God, oh, jeez, you know, cold calling. Come on, we're busy. Anyway, he's showing us his diamond stones. I, I finally look at the business card. You know, after 15 or 20 minutes, because it was an interesting pitch. It was the president of CMT. And I thought, oh, <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, so I, I tried some diamond stones at it, and it made such a huge difference um, on, the, on the early end of, of work. So. DMT or CMT? CMT. I didn't know CMT made it. Oh, no, you're right. It's DMT. Okay. I'm sorry. <clears throat> All right, cool. CMT was a router bit manufacturer. Yeah. <laughs> Still is. Yeah, I used I, to use for P Lamb after I had <laughs> AD and after then KD. I got confused. Yeah. We're not that's that's the outro. That's when the music starts playing in. Well, that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. If you have any questions you'd like answered on the show, please send them into shoptalk at taunton.com. The question box is getting a little empty, folks. Come on. I know you're listening. I see the numbers. Send in those questions. Get the conversation started. You tell us what to talk about. If you're watching on YouTube, click that thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening. I lost my video. Other than that, I'm good. There's only so much beauty one can take in at one time. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah.